I we should be live with that now. Let me give it a second. All right. <laughs> And wait just a moment to get up. Oh, everybody has been pulled into the session here, it looks like. So, yes, I think we're good to go. Uh, welcome back after a, after a brief break. Uh, happy to introduce our, our next speaker. Uh, good friend of mine, Hugh Desmond, a fantastic scholar who's worked on all kinds of stuff. Uh, and today will be talking to us uh, from... Uh, at the moment, is, he's uh, connected with the uh, the HPST in, in Paris, as well as the University of Antwerp. And today, he'll be talking to us about academic status in a digital age, invisible barriers to open science. And just a brief sort of pre-plug, uh, if you're interested in open science questions, come back tomorrow as well. Make sure to be here. There's uh, yet, more to, yet more open science discussion going on tomorrow. This is a topic that I think is I'm really excited to have uh, discussed at the conference. So without further ado, Hugh, take it away. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm I'm speaking into a, a Zoom screen. So, but yeah, let's just trust that everything is there and um, everybody's listening on. So uh, I'm going to be talking about academic status today um, with regards to open science. Maybe just a first remark about okay, just to be on the same page. What is open science? Because there are a lot of definitions and understandings out there. Some approaches focus on types of practices. They define open science in terms of practices like open access or uh, data sharing, sharing data sets, uh, protocol pre-registration, and so on. Um, a, a broader approach uh, defines it in terms of value. So the value of transparency is obviously uh, number one there, but also equality and participation um, so, in the sense, you know, you have open science in spirit and open science in practice. Um, I'll be focusing uh, predominantly on the value of transparency and, and offer some critical reflections about the value of transparency. Um, because one question that uh, st strikes me uh, when observing the open science literature, debate, discussion, is that it's not really clear to me what are the downsides to open science. Uh, and so one parallel here, inspiration, is kind of what's been, you know, the rise and fall uh, a little bit in, in public domain of social media. So, you know, not even 10 years ago, it's, it's crazy when you think about it, but not even 10 years ago, social media was really seen as unambiguously positive for democracy, for instance. Uh, think of the Arab Spring or the Euro Maiden Revolution in Ukraine. Social media was this new thing that was going to allow sharing and allow new communities to be formed and ultimately uh, to spread democracy uh, everywhere in the world. And uh, fast forward to today, uh, of course, the narrative has radically changed. So the side effects of this uh, transparency have become well recognized. A uh, recent book by Zuboff there about surveillance capitalism. So how our privacy is being commoditized by large corporations. Uh, mental health problems. So that's a graph from uh, a paper by uh, uh, John Twenge. Uh, how um, social media use uh, is positively correlated with incidents of depression, uh, especially among teenage girls. Uh, and then, of course, we're not even talking about uh, challenges of fake news, echo chambers, and so on. And the list only seems to be growing. So uh, we're not going to go into that today, but just kind of as an illustration of how, uh, you know, I, I need to think of these, these are one of the favorite graphs of stock market investors of how narratives can form and can come to dominate uh, stock markets. Uh, and at the top, everybody's talking about a new paradigm. And that's, of course, just before the crash. So it's, I mean, I'm not saying something exactly uh, like this is going on with open science, but there is a lot of uh, enthusiasm in some quarters uh, here is a particular, particularly clear example um, 
uh, where just m- more scientific transparency is just unambiguously good. Uh, no, no bad side effects to be seen um, from an edited volume. Um, so talking about the second scientific revolution, I'm just reading here. So picture a situation in which scientists would be able to publish all their thoughts, results, conclusions, data, and such as they occur openly and widely available to everybody. You know, thanks to the internet, this is of course possible. And consequence, Knowledge could flow quickly, regardless of institutions and personal networks. Research results could be published as they occur. There would be no need to wait until results are complete enough to support a full paper. So it sounds like a fantastic thing. Of course, you know, you present these couple of sentences to a philosopher and, you know, just begin to parse the first sentence, you know, picture a situation in which scientists would be able to publish all their thoughts. All? Are you sure about that? All their thoughts and as they occur? No uh, no filtering? But okay, so uh, there are some extreme examples out there, but there are also um, what I would regard as, as uh, sophisticated and very plausible examples of this thought and a very nice uh, recent paper by Ram Cohesen and uh, Liam Bryce about uh, defending uh, the abolishment of pre-publication, peer review, and, and they make a very, very strong case and uh, will um, make most readers seriously doubt whether we really still need or even want pre-publication peer review. And some kind of ideas, assumptions in their view is that, well, a citation count as a better long-term measure of scientific worth. So that peer review is a short-term measure, but it doesn't always uh predict well how an idea or a piece of scientific work will be uh, taken up by the community. And they have a brief discussion about prestige biases. Uh, prestige bias will be uh, central to this talk, uh, but they they say that, that there's no evidence that it would in- intensify uh, inequality in science. And these are, are themes that are going to come back. Uh, this talk isn't um, going to going to target their view as such, going to present a more general picture. But this is a an instance of how it's unclear really what downsides there are of this move towards transparency. And my basic idea uh, focuses on the challenge of information overload. Uh, overload uh, crucial uh, for you know any decision-making uh, process, how to select information uh, in, in a complex environment. And of course, gatekeeping is one way of doing that. So if we get rid of gatekeeping, you know, we're still left with the information overload. So what are the other strategies? And in the era of open science, uh, the, the two main ones are via social media, social media recommendations and search algorithms. So be kind of um, analyzing these in more detail to show how the value of transparency uh, is manifested um, in in these uh, strategies. And I'm going to argue that um, social media and search algorithms are actually riddled with status biases um, and that they actually amount to uh, new invisible barriers, call them invisible because they're there, but they're, they're not manifested in job titles or in uh, n- institution names and so on. But nonetheless, there are pockets of opaque decision making. They're not transparent um, and they effectively exclude some scientists. Um, OK, yeah, so yeah, let's move on. Quick background. What is social status? Uh, why are minds so focused towards social status, this kind of ranking of individuals within a community? Um, and uh, prestige as a form of status. So prestige is, is peculiar to, to human beings. Um, and it's very connected to uh, the importance of social learning for the human species. You know, why do we have gatekeepers in the first place? Why do we learn from others? Basic answer is that individual learning is really weak. So the whole science of cultural evolution 
is based on that one insight that individual learning is very weak, uh, that social learning is extremely important, um, and that so culture is one way of uh, 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 structuring social learning. So we, we learn best in structured environments. Uh, some, some books there of Sterelny and, and Henrich that, that develop these, these insights. And so status um, is something more general than uh, just uh, prestige itself. Status in general is an, a group level adaptation to minimize conflict about who gets what. So, you know, like pecking orders and chickens. And um, cultural uh, evolutionary anthropologists often distinguish between two forms of status, dominance, which has to do with force or a threat of force, and prestige, which is then uh, indicative of a, a skill or a service uh, from, what, from, uh, from which others would benefit. Um, and so, you know, prestige, we often talk about that in a very uh, negative way, but within a broader picture, uh, if you look at the manifestations of status in the natural world, well, prestige is a pretty benevolent way of structuring status hierarchies, uh, uh, because in, in, namely in such a way that uh, social learning is promoted. And so we pay a lot of attention to uh, high prestige individuals, and that is, uh, you know, very relevant for the academic environment academic environment, which, you know, by first or any approximation, uh, also has a serious challenge of information overload. Just think of the number of articles published per year. Um, 2021, so we're about 3 million at the moment, but, you know, it's increasing uh, at 3% each year, but, you know, 3%, that's still an exponential increase. Um, and so there's an, that's an overload for any one researcher, obviously. Um, reading and un, even understanding scientific article requires a lot of effort. Uh, you know, we can, can assume that as a, as a given. Uh, so that, require, that, 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 that creates a need for some system of signaling about what to uh, invest time and energy in. And so obviously they're very basic uh, 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 adaptations here, like ha having a title is already one way of signaling uh, the information content of a piece. But we also rely on uh, social indicators. And just think about basic academic practices here uh, from this perspective of um, status hierarchies and status biases. So an editor how would an evolutionary anthropologist analyze the phenomenon of an editorship? Well, it's a it's a service to the community, right? They're doing a lot of work for the community, but it's also a, a high prestige uh, position. Uh, they have a lot of influence, also, uh, at least at least in principle. Uh, uh, maybe fifty or sixty years ago, it was uh, more apparent. A very interesting article there by. Um, uh, Chris Fassen, Fassen and, and, and Joel Katzoff on how changes of editorship at major uh, journals like uh, Philosophical uh, Review and Mind had a huge impact on uh, the evolution of 20th century philosophy. Academic rank uh, still, uh, you know, it sounds quaint, but if you look kind of carefully at some of the data, it seems that academic rank is only having an increasing impact on how we direct our attention, not less. Um, so there's this recent article, I forgot to put the uh, citation there, that um, citation inequality has been increasing. So the most highly ranked uh, members of the academic community are gaining a larger share proportionately of the uh, of this total citation count and why basically because their co-author networks are expanding um, by um, many multiples uh, and so in, in this way they're capturing a, a larger amount of citation the full story is also because uh, more and more academics are, are temporary uh, 
so they quickly leave the profession and they don't build up any type of reputation. So that inequality means that senior academics uh, can capture more of the citations. And so um, the, the phenomenon of gift authorship is precisely uh, an indication of how academic rank still matters uh, hugely in how uh, scientists direct their attention to you know, which papers to read, which papers uh, to take seriously. Uh, gift authorship is this practice. It's considered a form of misconduct, but where you uh, give authorship to a senior academic uh, in, in order to increase its visibility and credibility and thus uh, citation count. So it's, it's a rational response, actually, to uh, uh, the academic environment, even though um, it's, uh, it's frowned upon, of course. So um, getting back now to the issue of uh, pre-publication peer review, which will, you know, the, as, as uh, 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 indicative of the role of gatekeepers will be um, kind of the main example uh, for the rest of the presentation. What is pre-publication pre peer review? Simply uh, a vetting by a small group of, uh, of experts who are trusted uh, by assumption. So that uh, that is a signal then of its trustworthiness to a larger community. So if we do away with that, well, it's plausible that we can do away with it, definitely in the age of open science, but precisely because there are different ways now of sifting through the massive amount of uh, academic material uh, being published every year on top of, you know, all of, all of the existing work, namely social media, uh, so search algorithms and social media uh, recommendations. So, I want to now um, look in more detail uh, in the role of biases in search algorithms and uh, social media recommendations to show that there, are, I'm not saying that there are downsides, but um, there are questions to be asked whether uh, the drive towards transparency, uh, if it doesn't produce n new forms of of opaqueness uh, in areas that we might not realize um, them to be. Search algorithms, um, just let's focus on Google Scholar. Um, as increasing, they're, they're increasingly the dominant um, uh, place uh, where um, academic material is sifted through. There's PubMed and Scopus and so on, but Google Scholar uh, is is more and more accepted, and more uh, more and more used. The algorithm of Google Scholar is not public knowledge. Uh, so, you know, this is what Google Scholar says about its own algorithm. It aims to rank documents the way researchers do, weighing the full text of each document, where it was published, who it was written by as well as how often and how recently it has been cited in other scholarly literature. Now, of course, I'm not, nobody can blame Google for not making it public, you know, even though it's, it's strange that in the age of open science, we're increasingly relying on a proprietary uh, search algorithm. Uh, but if you make a, an algorithm like that public knowledge, it can be uh, relatively uh, easily gamed. And that might be, one reason why they don't want to do it. Nonetheless, uh, some time ago, back in 2009, um, it was some. It was partially reverse engineered by two uh, German computer scientists, and well, what they find: citation count is the dominant factor uh, in uh, the Google Scholar algorithm. So there's no surprises there. Um, but nonetheless, uh, its proprietary nature is uh, surely worrying for the core values of open science. But I think the, the problems go deeper. So there's, there's not that much information about the algorithm of Google Scholar. But there is uh, much more about 
uh, Google's uh, search algorithm for its its main uh, search engine. Uh, I mean, it's more public. Uh, uh, you know, the founders of Google um, um, they they published it in a scientific article back in 1999. Um, PageRank. So PageRank was was purely formal. Uh, so it it, it didn't. Uh, directly evaluate the content of pages, only looked at the number of connections. But Google quickly abandoned it because it was open to abuse. Strategies like keyword stuffing or putting in a lot of um, uh, links to other websites and so on. So uh, I find this amazing. Uh, Google now employs uh, a lot of what they call search quality raters to tweak um, the results uh, or how different factors are rated uh, uh, are weighted. So they have this whole uh, long document on guidelines for their um, uh, search quality raters. And when you do a bit of a deep dive in, in how precisely are these decisions being made about search quality, you know, you get you get to and and there's a, a little uh, a citation there. Uh, your money, your life topics, so uh, uh, financial websites and uh, health websites. Um, careful checks for reputation are required, and what is reputation? Based on evidence from experts, professional societies, awards, and so on. And so, Google's search algorithm is anchored on the judgments of professional societies of awards uh, which are in turn made by professional societies and so <laughs> i haven't used a meme yet uh, in, in a presentation uh, or in a talk so i thought this was a good place to begin i'm I was flabbergasted the first time uh, I, I read about this, but obviously I'm I'm naive and and and, and place uh, uh, unthinking trust in Google, um, and I'm just amazed at how um, the search media algorithms, which are presented as these this neutral sifting through of information on the World Wide Web, boils down to very. Uh, this is the same old fashioned uh, uh, markers of quality, namely professional judgments. So, you know, there, if you put it in, 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 in steps, you know, uh, uh, we want to take this decision making power away from the old model of gatekeepers, the professions and, 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 the, and the peer review and so on. Instead, handing some or a lot, who knows, uh, to private corporations, that's already a strange move in itself uh, for something like open science. But these private corporations have found that their purely formal algorithms are open to abuse. They can be gamed. So they're always tweaking it, uh, correcting it. How? By ultimately following the judgments of, uh, the, uh, uh, of professional gatekeepers via content evaluators, uh, which they then hire. So I'm um, so it's just a, just, you know, what, what's the lesson that I want to draw from this? It's not a, it's not a value judgment. It's not bad. Google undoubtedly had very good reasons for making this step that they did all sorts of abuses, uh, of the, the, the search engine, but it does show how the drive to transparency um, makes other changes necessary. So, um, I mean, this is based on, on, on Tversky and Kahneman, of course, but in, in um, uh, communication science, a typical dis distinction is to make between heuristic uh, decision strategies and analytic uh, uh, strategies. The first where uh, purely formal properties are looked at and the second where you know the agent actually goes through the content and makes a makes a makes a, makes a judgment call and in this distinction you know peer review is 
more on the analytic side, you know, by assumption, there's at least two people going through carefully, going through the text. Of course, there are biases there uh, as well, but it's uh, it's um, designed to be analytic. You take that away, um, you know, we can't make purely heuristic uh, 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 strategies work. So Google has come full circle and is coming back that, well, these heuristics, they need to be anchored on the uh, analytic decision-making strategies. Okay, um, until there, my uh, discussion of uh, transparency in, social, uh, in, in search algorithms. Moving on now to that second uh, class of strategies for deciding what scientific material to pay attention to is social media recommendations. And so it's increasingly clear that promotion on social media makes a big difference for uh, uptake. Uh, by the community so of course these are these are correlations not causations um, so it, it could be of course that uh, the most influential researchers to begin with are the ones who tweet the most it's probably likely part of the effect as well uh, so i don't know if these studies actually disentangle that kind of you know do the uh, intervention uh, how much causal difference does tweeting actually make? But the effect sizes are are huge. Um, if you just look at the difference between tweeted and non-tweeted, these are for uh, coloproctologists and uh, uh, thoracic surgeons. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't, and of course, I don't know to what extent that would generalize. Uh, but in any case, there are some indications that social media status. Right, so number of followers, uh, one's presence on social media can translate into academic status, uh, you know, citation count, uh, and you know when citation count is taken as a proxy for uh, scientific worth, right? As as proposed by by some, that that it's that's the it's the true long term uh, value. Uh, the long long term uh, 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 sorry it's a true measure of long term worth then we have a situation where promotion on on self uh, uh, on, on social media uh, can strongly impact uh, perceptions of scientific worth but the, the question is then what is it that determines social media status and here uh, the old biases uh, are coming in to play. Just to give one example, gender bias. Um, again, just basing this on one study. Of course, it sounds plausible. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it fits a certain narrative, of course, right? Because this is kind of something that we would be expecting. Um, so with that caveat in mind, of course, um, but nonetheless, you know, striking results. Um, this study here, recent study about gender differences in Twitter use. Does rank institutional prestige and so on also uh, promote social media status? I'm, I don't know. I haven't come across any studies, but of course, one wouldn't be surprised if it did. So to recap, um, the argument and, and systematize it a little bit more. Uh, I pointed to the feature, it's just a feature uh, of the academic environment, scientific environment of information overload. And the developments of open science won't change information overload. It's in, in fact, uh, as we publish more and more rapidly, information overload will likely only increase. So, if you couple that to proposals to get to abolish uh, uh, pre-publication peer review, then more work needs to be done by these selection mechanisms, uh, such as social media 
recommendations or search algorithms or a combination of two of the both of both of course because what we see appearing on our social media feed is itself uh, being selected for by algorithms and so um, more of the decision making of what is valuable and what is not valuable is being done by these um, opaque uh, proprietary algorithms. So I'm not saying that this is necessarily negative for science, although, you know, it does just raise some doubts. But the argument can uh, be made with more certainty that it undermines this idea that you can just promote transparency and uh, in, 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 an, in a consistent way. So it, if you promote transparency in one area, so in, in publishing, in communication, that increases information overload, increases the need for a selection mechanism, and how precisely that selection mechanism occurs becomes uh, less transparent. And these, this lack of transparency constitutes, in different ways, uh, new, less obvious barriers to open science. Uh, so proprietary uh, search algorithms are one, uh, promotion on social media, uh, represents uh, another set of barriers, barriers based on gender, uh, based on uh, rank, uh, institution, um, and also a barrier oops, um, for those who do not wish uh, to invest that same level of time and energy on social media. So it's we're, we're kind of in a strange situation where we complain about how much time we need to invest in grants and in wasted time on you know peer reviewers who are unfair and so on but you know our time spent on social media is increasing and and you know where's the discussion there uh is that is that always such a good idea and finally uh, the erosion of norms of collegiality and trust oh i see charles reappearing um I'm, I'm done actually, um, which I've, um, uh, which many people have talked about and which I've uh, touched upon uh, in other work. So take away, um, this being predominantly a uh, negative argument, but it's, it's not really against open science. Uh, it's more against, uh, inspired or, 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 or uh, from this idea that there are no free lunches. So I'm just wondering what is the price to pay? There has to be some price to pay. And if we reduce the reliance on one flawed mechanism, well, then we're gonna increase our reliance on other flawed mechanisms. And is, is that a problem? Also not necessarily, but we just should be aware that these mechanisms are flawed. There is a remaining a residual uncertainty on what the value is of any academics or any scientists work uh, but these selection mechanisms are constructed in such a way that they give the appearance of uh, a clarity or of a, a lack of uncertainty about the value of work so um parting words then uh Open science surely represents the future, but let's be aware of the challenges. So, thank you. Fantastic. I didn't mean to pressure you. I was just getting my making sure my camera would still work. No, I, I, <laughs> no, uh, I was checking out my, my own timing. I went to business time. Got a number of questions already coming in, so let me yeah let me get let me get right to it. So uh, one from from Stefan Hesperig, and this is this is a nice point. So uh, and this this actually probably relates to your to your last takeaway. So there's a good good connection here. So 
Uh, this talk seems to describe, uh, describes a world that in which libraries no longer seem to exist, right? We have institutions that are full of professionals who are trained to help us cope with information overload. So how, how do you think the picture changes if we, if we start to rethink the role of libraries as mediators or facilitators of open science? Is there uh, is, is actually a, a follow-up from... Um, Mm -hmm. Alex, most looking to comment in a comment on the question, like, so is there a, is there a call for a new role for library sciences to play here as a field, perhaps? Kind of new uh, forms of curation, basically. Then, so like the librarian, the the I mean, the, the traditional task of the librarian is to to make a some type of pre selection, of course, right? Which books are worth um, adding to the collection and which aren't. Um, yeah, I know I am describing a world when libraries don't exist and I don't know if, to what extent that describes most academics today, surely not all those who need to do archival work, but uh, I think in the natural sciences, yeah, uh, uh, paper versions of journals are uh, less and less being published, but you could say, well, uh, we need more um, uh, digital librarians. And I guess you see signs of that emerging. Um, you know, like these annotated bibliographies, um, systematic reviews, of course. Uh, I mean, this, this work of trying to systematize uh, 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 knowledge in, in kind of a curated way. Um, yeah. But does, yeah, does, is that, um, how would you square that with some of the fundamental values of open science? Because you're, you're giving power then to this librarian uh, to make decisions on what is valuable and what is not. Um, uh, so, I mean, the scope of my argument just concerned how consistent the rationale is or one of the rationales under underlying open science, namely that more transparency uh, is a good thing. Um, and there's just too little talk about the problem of information overload. Um, and so I, I, I probably would agree that we will need librarians in the future or some some type of librarian. Sure. Uh, next question coming in from uh, Eugenio Petrovich says, thanks for your talk, very interesting. Uh, I'm wondering, however, whether your argument could be sort of recruited by the big publishers to defend the expensive paywalls behind which they're guarding scientific publications, right? Yeah. Paywalls might be the just cost for scientific quality, good peer review, and so on, et cetera. And so they can justify their whole, you know, profit margin. Um, yeah. And so that, uh, uh, since he has an, oh, he adds in a comment here. So si you know, since one of the big arguments for open science is sort of monopoly busting, uh, uh, maybe that, uh, uh, that, that's, a, that's a consideration that can cut against, I, I guess, some of the, some of the other, the other claims here, perhaps. When you make a critical argument, there's always the danger of it being abused, um, you know, uh, in the discussions about, you know, evolution versus creationism. Every biologist who had some critical remarks about Darwinism was immediately pounced on uh, by the creationists. And so, so let's, I would just say first, let's not make these critical uh, arguments known to big publishers and keep it uh, among a more closed circle. <laughs> That's not very open, of course, but um, um, but I mean, I was I had my, my argument was mainly focused on this idea of abolishing peer review um, and, and just, you know, more than just I mean, that, that goes way further than just uh, abolishing the type of uh, rentiership of the big publishing houses like like Springer and so on. I mean, that, that goes, I mean, that would be like the abolishment of, of journals and of editors that we just post everything to an online repository, this huge online repository where everything is there. 
and you can't know whether it's a draft to be revised or and so on. Um, and so um, I'm targeting more the that extreme scenario and pointing to reasons why that doesn't that scenario doesn't really make sense in the end if you think through the consequences. But yeah, the the position of the big publishing houses that's almost that's almost not a, an intellectual. I mean, that's not an academic question anymore. That's just a political struggle. I mean, the, yeah, I don't want to don't want to become too political here, even though probably everybody agrees. But fair enough. No, fair enough. Um, next question. Let me see. Uh, just I'm, I'm I'm trying. It's not resorting my my questions by votes. Next question comes in from uh, from Rose Trappis, who who asks. Uh, so are, do you know, are there any other search engines or databases with published search algorithms? Uh, how do they fit into the picture? Is there, is there a way to sort of open this, this black box a little more? Um, probably. So, I mean, the basic problem is that Google is in, as a monop uh, an entrenched because apparently so to make a good search algorithm, you need more than just, you know, a bunch of computer whizzes uh, having a great algorithm. You need a lot of data and a lot of uh, users using your search algorithm so you can actually tweak. Uh, so you can, you know, figure out what are the most common spelling errors or, you know, people in Luvana Neuve, what are they mainly searching for and give different results than for Luvana Neuve than... Uh, for New York and so on. And so uh, even if it would be published, uh, I don't know how, how much it, it, it would change uh, the, the, the position of, of, of Google. Um, and the second uh, thing then to keep in mind is that there's a, there is a principled reason for not publishing it because once it's public knowledge, it can be gamed um, in, in abusive ways. And of course, I think that's the main argument that Google would use uh, not to publish it. Um, and, the, you know, with some justification, uh, there is this whole science of search engine optimization. So people know what Google likes and there's a there's an art or a science to it. And so they try to tweak their content in such ways that it, it'll rise up so you know through some reverse engineering people know some of the large-scale features of what google likes of course a, a virtuous form of that would be where you would ga game google by just publishing qualitative content and so then we're then there's re th there's no problem in that case but um that's not this that's not the situation uh, so if if you rely on heuristics uh, formal characteristics uh, you know you can have the appearance of quality but without uh, having the content of quality uh, so that's why these algorithms can be can be gamed um, in, in in vicious ways so yeah. sure um Oh, uh, just a, actually a, a quick note from the chat. Actually, Dan Hicks mentions, uh, says, I'm wondering if dimensions.ai or Microsoft academic search might be more open than, than Google Scholar. So there could be an interesting kind of comparative data set there um, in, in seeing if, if there's something to be learned from their guts. Um, I haven't looked into that. Yeah. Next question comes in from, from Stefan Linquist, who asks, uh, who says, uh, so, do you think there's an appetite, uh, sufficient appetite for a, a slow science movement? So a movement away from all the flash in the pan stuff that gets published on, on social media. And so how could a, that kind of thing exist in, in the current sort of reward system of, of doing science? Um. I don't know, it, it'll probably get worse before it gets better. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right, there should be some type of slow science movement. And there is, there are some kind of, um, I remember coming across some references, let's, let's do slow science. But that's the problem, because our minds are so 
there it's you know the, these status biases are so strong have such a strong hold on our mind and and you see a person and oh, their h index is 125 oh my goodness that is so amazing and it, it it seems to be entrenched that way because it's viewed as a status indicator and everybody accepts it as a status indicator and it's it's difficult to change um until then the 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 downsides just become too great and too obvious uh, to deny um but yeah i'm not i'm not super optimistic about calls for slow science uh just yet anyway um because there's a difference between calls for it but and then but and actually changing how uh administrators think about uh science and how um or or that 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 level of of, of scientists who are you know politicians and managers um you know the the beneficiaries of the system they're also very loath uh, to change the system. yeah 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 uh let me ask for a quick response because I just want to eat a tiny bit of our upcoming 10-minute break. We have a long break here so I can get away with this. Uh, just to ask the last question from, from Luca Rivelli, and I'm going even, to even summarize his question a little bit. Apologies, Luca. Um, I, I wonder, so do you think uh, uh, perhaps one way to interpret what's happening here is to say... Uh, open science needs to come with open social media. So maybe part of the problem here is the sort of nature of commercial social media, as opposed to a, a hypothetical future academic social media. Maybe there's a, a way out there to resolve some of those, of those issues. Or do you think that the arguments that you made are just going to, uh, that this is sort of too tied up with human nature and we're just gonna fall back into? Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh... Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a bit more uh, inclined to the second. Um, I think there's also, yeah, I, I don't know what it would look like, uh, a social media, um, as as described there. Um, you know, because like if you think, okay, let's take away, they're experimenting with that. Uh, so let's let's hide the number of likes. I think Facebook was uh, experimenting with that in, in some countries. I think Australia, they're experimenting with us on a local level. Let's let's hide the number of likes because it's a source of anxiety for users. Um, but you know, one of the reasons to have this type of like system is precisely also to allow us to focus on and to make some kind of distinction um, about what post to focus on. Uh, so, yeah, um, I, my more positive uh, message, uh, just not to be entirely pessimistic, um, is is that um, in this discussion, it's often too much focused on how we should create structures, social structures that are ideal. Uh, but perhaps there are just no flawless social structures, social media, and so on, and some degree of a health, healthy skepticism uh, is in order, you know. So that just not to give too much credence and too much value to the, 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 the evaluations that we see on social media and search algorithms, and All peer right. review for that matter. <laughs> 